praise the name of the Lord forever. Amen. He's so good. You know, everything that we go through, everything that we need, isn't it just amazing? You just think about that. God's so amazing. He knows everything. Bible, he knows what you did today. And if he knows what you're going to do tomorrow. He already has a plan for each and every one of us. How he good like that? How he loves us. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> Did you know too that the Lord He um, has even set up a system for us where our money is actually spiritually blessed and protected. Not just us and our family and. Um, situations in life that we go through, but even our money is kind of weird too, isn't it? But he knows everything about us. It's amazing. Um, and when, even when you look at the names of God in the, in the Bible, El Shaddai, you know, the Lord God Almighty. Repeat that with me. The Lord God Almighty. Hallelujah. <laughs> He is all-sufficient, all-powerful, right? And he triumphs over every obstacle and every opposition that we have. Amen. Not only is God the source of our provision and able to satisfy our every need, but he can also bless our provision too. Did you know that? It's up to us, though, to align with the system that the Lord has set up and put in the Bible for us to follow. Um, he put it in place. And uh, he'll make sure it happens if we align ourselves with him and with the system he set up. So uh, God, we know, he doesn't print off the money that we have to hold and to go to the stores with, right? He doesn't sit up there in heaven and print off little debit cards for us to use. Everybody understands that, right? Um, but, because if he did, he counterfeit money, right? And God is not in the counterfeiting business at all. Some Christians, though, they have a mistaken understanding that God is just going to drop money in their lap. You ever just thought that? You don't have to do anything. You just sit on your couch. The Lord just going to drop it out of heaven. And they think that there's just going to be a, cash, a, a pile of cash just sitting by their coffee pot or beside uh, the toaster when they get up in the morning. But that's just really not the way that the kingdom works, right? And uh, God, he has to use a natural means to get his provision to each of us. And when I say each of us, I mean Christians, his children, right? And that means that the money that we're believing for will come through someone or something um, that has a connection to us somehow. The Lord can even bless us with a new job or a better paying job. Amen. Uh, God does supernatural things in the spiritual realm to move things in the natural realm on our behalf. Does it all the time. And for those who don't have eyes to see, they might interpret those things when they do happen as just basically something weird. And it's, you know, a coincidence. But that's often how God really does work, especially in that area of provision for his children. Now, once the money of provision is rightfully ours, and it's in our possession, in our bank, in our pocket, in our purse, in our real flow, um, how do we as Christians ensure that it comes under the kingdom system and uh, we remove it from the world's corruption? Well, we do that by giving it to God in the form of tithes, offerings, alms, and first fruits. Now we know that in this church, we never, uh, hardly ever, um, ask for anything to go into these offering plates. We point them out to you uh, to let you know that they're here. If you want to give, then you give, um, because that's between you and the Lord. And that's kind of what this teaching tonight is about. Um, I actually, Two reasons for uh, this teaching tonight. One was that a lady that was in the church um, told me that she was reading the Bible and she didn't understand what tithes and offerings were. And she asked me to kind of explain it to her. 
And so I was uh, telling her about it and having that discussion. And at the same time, the Lord brought to my remembrance a dream he gave me. He gave me a dream a few years ago. And in the dream, he had me teaching here in this church. And he had me teaching on tithes and offerings. And that was weird because even then, we didn't pass the offering plate. We didn't ask for offerings or tithes. Um, we just kind of, Pastor Danny, when he's pre preaching, he'll occasionally say, you put something here if you want to, I'm not begging for your money. We don't ask for your money for this church. And we've heard him say that a thousand times. Well, the Lord, one day gave me a dream. And in this dream, as I was saying, I was speaking, and I asked the Lord in prayer, I was like, Lord, I don't understand because we don't ask for money for this church because, you know, people know that God has given offering or tithe or whatever you lay on their heart to do. I said, I don't understand what this dream is about and what you want me to do with it. And he's like, are you trying to steal their blessing from them? You know, I don't know if any of y'all have talked to the Lord, but he was kind of getting on me. And I was like, what? We ain't stealing nothing from these people. We bless them all the time. We're always giving. We give. We, we're givers. We give everything. He's like, Lord, you're trying to steal their blessing? I'm like, well, I don't even understand what you're talking about. And he told me, he said, well, when you don't teach on tithes and offerings, then how are they supposed to know that they can have blessings? I have blessings for them. How can I bless them if you don't teach them? How do they know? So uh, a couple times a year, we'll drag out an uh, offering and a tithe teaching just because the Lord told me a few years ago that it's our responsibility to make sure that the people that are under us understand that. So we give it back to God. Amen. So a funny thing happens when you start talking about money as a Christian. Most people start to get uncomfortable. Money is one of the things that most people don't want to talk about at all, especially not in church. And somehow, most folks feel like talking about money is unspiritual and it's worldly. And some of that ill feeling is warranted because, unfortunately, there's some preacher who that's all that they preach about. And when that happens, the preacher is getting in the flesh because God never manipulates and he doesn't control anyone like that over their finances. At the same time, though, even when ministers teach about money with a godly perspective, some Christians get irritated because they feel like the church has no business in their business. You know what I mean? So to speak. So um, that's also a fleshly attitude. It's just on the part of the listener instead of the preacher that time. Uh, you know, Jesus spoke about money in the Bible. People who say money isn't appropriate for ministers to talk about will have to set aside much of what Jesus said in the Bible. Because during his earthly ministry, he did talk about money. In fact, Jesus had more to say about money than he did about heaven. Now, I know that's hard to believe, but that's true. In fact, the only subject that Jesus talked about more than money was the kingdom of God. And some of his teachings on the kingdom of God it also dealt with money. In the parable of the unjust doer, Jesus calls managing money the least of our responsibilities. In Luke 16, 10 uh, through 11, that's Luke 16, 10 through 11, if you want to write it down or go there. He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much, and he who is unjust in what he is least is unjust also in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to trust you the true riches? Now, Jesus didn't mean that we should ignore money because it's not important. When he says it's the least of our responsibilities, he means that money is the first thing that we need to get sorted out. If we can't handle our money properly and in a godly way, then we're going to have problems in every area of our lives. Therefore, money is critically important. Our attitudes towards money and how we manage it is a foundation that sets the stage for every other aspect of a spiritual life. And if our understanding of money lays the foundation of our spiritual life, then tithing is the place.
place that we need to start. Uh, God, he formerly instituted tithes in the Old Covenant law of Moses. The tithe was to be offered to the priest and was to be used to support the priest. And as with most of the law, God's people weren't very good at keeping up with the tithe. Then at the very end of the Old Testament, though, God speaks about the tithe through his Old Covenant prophet, Malachi. And he reveals two huge promises that are attached to the spiritual act of tithing. So let's turn there. Malachi 3. Malachi 3. We're going to read 8, starting in verse 8 through 12. <coughs> Malachi 3, 8, it says, Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me, but ye say, wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house, and prove me now herewith, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sake, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time of the field, says the Lord of hosts. And all nations shall call you blessed, for ye shall be a delightsome land, says the Lord of hosts. So did you catch any of the promises in there when we read that? The windows of heaven. God says that when we tithe, it unlocks something in the spiritual realm that enables him to start taking action on our behalf. The first thing that happens is that God is able to open up the windows of heaven and begin to pour out additional finance and other types of blessing into our lives if, we're willing to, if we are willing to receive that. Now that's huge. I mean, God is blessing us all the time, right? Amen? Turn to your neighbor and say, God blesses me all the time. That's right. Hallelujah. Now he even blesses the ungodly in spite of themselves. You can find that in Matthew 5, 45. But when we tithe to our local church, we allow God to supercharge his blessing over our finances. It enables him to bring increase to our finances in ways that we would never even expect. Amen. The second blessing that he talks about in those scriptures is rebuke the devourer. That's the devil, in case you didn't know. <laughs> of course, increasing our finances wouldn't do us any good if all the increase was just being wasted, right? Fortunately, when we tithe, it also involves something else in the spiritual realm for us. And God steps in. He actively rebukes the devourer on our behalf, it says, to keep our finances from being drained off by all sorts of things beyond our control. Now just think about it. How much of what you spend your money on seems kind of frivolous to you, if you really stop and think about it? Do you get frustrated at having an unexpected bill pop up and eat away at your finances? That's the devourer. He's moving in right then on that bank account or in your bill phone. And he will, if you'll let him. That's not God. He doesn't take it from us. It's the devourer, the enemy of our souls. You know, Jesus said he comes to kill, destroy, and steal from us. Right? Hallelujah. So, as I said, I had uh, more, actually more than one person talk to me about teaching about tithes. So let's start with what isn't tithe, because some people might not know. The very word tithe means tenth, one tenth. Um, the tithe is one tenth of a person's increase through wages, production, sales, um, however you make your money, amen? It's the first tenth of a person's increase that God himself designated to be set aside for the kingdom. Amen? So how old is tithing? You 
know, so can we just make this up and, you know, try to get into your pockets? Of course not. Tithing is as old as the human race is. Tithing was practiced by nations such as Egypt and Babylon in ancient times. And where did the concept of tithing even originate from? Uh, well, the first Bible reference is found in Genesis 4. And um, that's a Bible story we haven't broken out yet, but some of you already know it. Abel brought the first fruit of his flock and presented it to the Lord. And isn't it an interesting note right here that the very first case of jealousy and murder that occurred was over the issue of the tithes? Hello? <laughs> And so some people might be saying, well, wait just a minute. Didn't tithing actually begin with the law of Moses? No, it did not. Um, it was a practice, tithing was practiced over 400 years before the law was even given. 400 years. So turn to Genesis 14 in your Bible. Genesis 14, 20. 14, 20. And it says, Praise be to God, Most High, who delivered your enemies into your land. And then Abram gave him a tenth of everything. So right there, he gave him a tenth of everything that he took in, in the battle. Amen? Of what would be his paycheck. So we find that Abram gave tithes and, uh, to the high priest who uh, tells us that he at that time was a type of Christ. Uh, Jacob made a vow to give God tithes of everything that he possessed in turn, um, and that's found in Genesis 28, Genesis 28, 20 through 22. It says, Then Jacob made a vow, saying, If God will be with me and watch over me on this journey, I'm taking and will give me food, and uh, will give me food to eat and clothes to wear, so that I return safely to my father's house, so then the Lord will be my God, and this stone that I have set as a pillar will be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will what? Give you a tenth. Now, although tithing was incorporated into the law of Moses, it didn't begin with that law. Before the law, tithing was a covenant of love between God and man. The law came as a result of, co of covenant breakers. The law was, and you can find that in 1 Timothy 1 9. We also know that the law is made not for the righteous, but for the lawbreakers, and for the rebels, the ungodly, the sinful, the unholy, for those who kill their fathers or mothers for murderers. When the law was fulfilled, tithing did not cease, but rather it returned back to the grace of the love and the covenant. For those who truly love God, tithing is not an obligation, but tithing is actually for a Christian a privilege. Amen? Turn to your neighbor and say, it's a privilege for me. That's right, yes. It brings blessings based on better promises. In Hebrews 8, 6, it says better promises. Amen? But now he's obtained a more excellent ministry in as, such, in as such as he also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. And Romans 6, 14, it tells us we are no longer under law, but under grace. We do not pay tithes. We don't pay tithes. We give, we give tithes as an honor to the Lord. Amen? We're honoring the Lord as a type of worship, a privilege for us. Amen? So, uh, you might ask yourself, or ask me, your pastor, what did Jesus teach about tithing? What did he have to say about the subject? Well, he had a lot to say. If you want to uh, turn to Matthew 23, 23. Matthew 23, 23. Jesus said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you pay your tithe of mint, anise, and cumin, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you 
ought to have done without leaving the others undone. In other words, right here, Jesus said, yes, you should have tithed, but you're not excused by tithing from the waiter aspects of the law. Justice, mercy, and faith. Jesus did not nullify tithing here. A lot of people use that as Jesus saying you don't have to tithe, but that's not what happened. Rather, he reinforced it with the New Testament emphasis on the heart. Jesus and his disciples as Jews would have made tithing a regular part of their faith and a regular practice. Amen? Turn your neighbor and say, Jesus did it. Uh, another question is um, that we might ask, doesn't tithing only apply to the nation of Israel? And of course, no. It's not true. As was said uh, earlier, tithing began with Abraham, who is the father of us all. That's what the Bible says, amen? Israel, or Jacob, came years later. Levi was one of the sons of Israel and was given the priesthood in the nation. In Hebrews 7, and that's Hebrews 7, 14 through 17, it tells us that Levi gave tithes indirectly and uh, through Abraham. Tithing preceded the nation of Israel in Abraham and extends beyond Israel to all the seed of Abraham. So we learn that Abraham gave tithes to Melchizedek. And Israel gave tithes to the Levi priesthood. And does it tithing then depend on the priesthood? Yes, it does. Our high priest is Jesus Christ. Amen? Jesus. So, the high priest ministry of Jesus is greater than any of that of Levi or the Mosaic Wall. And just as they received tithes from Abraham, so it is that Christ today receives tithes through his divine priesthood. In Hebrews 7, 8, it tells us, Here mortal men receive tithes, but there he receives them, of whom it is witness that he lives. Christ's priesthood is eternal, without beginning or without any end. Since the earliest times, the fathers of faith have recognized his priesthood through honoring him with the tithes. Today, there's only one high priest, amen, the Lord Jesus Christ. When we bring our tithes into the storehouse or the church, we should present them in our heart to him. It's a heart, and remember, we're giving, we're not paying. Tithing itself is a witness that he lives as our high priest. Amen? Turn to your neighbor and say, he's my high priest. That's right. Jesus. Hallelujah. So, next, the question. So if I do tithe, where do I get the tithes? So, obviously we can't transport tithes on up to heaven, right? It's not like when you go to the bank and stick your money in that little thing and sucks it up. You know, that's not how it works. <laughs> but, um, and neither should we. For he doesn't even need it there, right? God has everything he needs in heaven. But he does have another purpose for the time, right? His house, his church, right here on earth. Amen. You know, Jacob vowed in Genesis 28, 22 that he would establish God's house on the rock and then he was going to honor God with the tithe or the tent, is how he put it. God designated the tithe for his house. If you turn to Malachi 3, Malachi 3, 10, where we're going next, Malachi 3, 10, it says, and we read it just a few minutes ago, but I'm going to read it again. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. You know, in the Old Testament, the house of God was symbolized through the tabernacles. 
uh, to the tabernacle of David, of Moses, and the temples of Solomon and Herod. Well, Jesus introduced his body as a true temple of God, right? In John 2, John 2, 19 through 21, John 2, 19 through 21, it tells us in there, Destroy this temple, in three days I will raise it up. But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After Jesus died, he was buried. He ascended um, to heaven, but his body remained on the earth. And the church is his body. Amen? Is that what the Bible says? Jesus is the stone or the rock upon which the house of God is built. And it's stated in Matthew 16, 18, Matthew 16, 18, On this rock I will build my church. And Hebrews 3, 6, it states, But Christ is son over his own house, whose house are we? 2 Corinthians 6, 16, 2 Corinthians 6, 16. It calls the church the temple of the living God. The church is a true fulfillment of the house of God and the temple of God. So, therefore, it's the place for the cause. Amen? For your neighbor to say, it's the church. That's right. That's the answer. So, then, you might say, well, can I choose where I want to put my cause to? Before the temple was destroyed, in 70 AD, there was no question of where that tile belonged in the minds of the Jews. However, the concept of the house of God has been revealed in many progressive versions of the Old Testament. Beginning with the tabernacle of Moses. From tabernacle to temples, God was bringing forth a revelation of his house. God knew of the changes that would occur, and he instructed the people in Moses' day. He said, but ye shall seek the place where the Lord your God chooses to put his name for his dwelling place, and there ye shall go. There ye shall take your tithes. Take heed that you do not offer your burnt offering in every place that you seek, but in the place which the Lord chooses. Amen. So in Deuteronomy, it tells us that too in uh, Deuteronomy 14, 22 through 23. It says, We're to seek, seek out the place where the Lord has chosen to place his name. Before ascending to heaven, Jesus placed his name where? The church. So, where is it that every Christian, pagan, or heathen recognized as a representative of the name in any community when you ask them? 